Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, we're continuing our message series entitled, Not Just Mere Words. This is our fourth message in this series. And today's message is entitled, Words That Defile. I want to give you a little background to put some perspective on the scripture reading. See, the Pharisees and scribes had followed Jesus up from Jerusalem, and they were now accusing him of overlooking the faults of his disciples because they were breaking the tradition of the elders, because they were eating with unwashed hands. Listen, people believe that trolls and trolling were birthed with the creation of the internet, but that is a wrong assumption. From the time of Jesus, there were trolls. See, these Pharisees did not follow Jesus in the digital world. They followed him in the physical world. Therefore, there were trolls nonetheless. Jesus could have very well have said, listen, you trolls. But at any rate, Jesus had to give these trolls a little schooling on false assumptions. They were seeing perceived wrongs when there were no wrongs. But they themselves were actually guilty of doing wrong by breaking God's commandment for the sake of their traditions. Sounds hypocritical? Well, it was, and it still is. We Christians deal with that same thing pretty much every day. Nothing has changed. So after chastening them for their error, Jesus explains clearly what really defiles a person. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, verse 10 through 20. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Jesus said to the disciples, understand this. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles. Because what goes into the mouth does not stay in the mouth, nor does it stay in the body. But it goes into the mouth, then into the stomach, and then is expelled as waste. This is Jesus' own words explaining the parable to his disciples. And this, this is the kicker. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 15, verse 17 through 20. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. The mouth only speaks what is in the heart. In other words, whatever is in abundance in the heart, that is what the mouth cannot help but speak. Why? Because it is the most dominant, making it the most influential. Ever heard the saying, the squeaky wheel gets the most grease? Whatever the heart is full of will spill out of it and into the mouth and consequently be expressed in words. 
Therefore, if your heart is full of hatred and anger and slander and accusations and talebearing and gossip, that is what the mouth speaks because the mouth speaks only what it hears coming from the heart and what it hears, it repeats. So if you want to know what is in a person's heart, listen to their words. Not only what they say, but what they do not say. Why would that parable offend the Pharisees? Unless, of course, they were saying what was in their hearts and it did not line up with the word of God. You are only offended if you are guilty. If someone said that all child sex traffickers should be caught and given the death penalty, would that offend you? Obviously not. Unless, of course, you were guilty yourself. As a decent, ethical, God-fearing society, we protect our children. We do not exploit our children. We protect them. Thus, if you want to know what is in a person's heart, listen to their words, what they say, how they say it, and I guess to some extent, what offends them. Look at what Jesus told those Pharisees only three chapters earlier. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good? when you are evil, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Let me now read a different rendering, a rendering from the Message Bible, just to give you another perspective on what Jesus was saying. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, the Message Bible. You have minds like a snake pit. How do you suppose what you say is worth anything when you are so foul-minded. It's your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. Wow. It is your heart that gives your words their meaning and not the dictionary. That is pretty powerful. Your heart defines your speech. That is the reason our words no longer mean what they originally meant. For instance, years ago, the word gay meant joyous and lively, merry, happy, lighthearted. Today, that same word is used to describe a homosexual man. Our hearts define our words. Therefore, according to Jesus, our words can defile us because they show us for who we truly are. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 2. The heart of the wise inclined to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. King Solomon said, if you are wise, your heart leans right. And if you are a fool, it will lean to the left. So do with that information what you see fit. As for me, I want to show you something powerful using a little English grammar. Look at this, verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. That word translated defiles is the Greek word koinoi. It comes from the Greek word koinu, which means to make common or to share. So this Greek word koinoi is first of all a verb, which means the subject or the person does something or is actively doing something. Then it is in the present tense, which means that the action is occurring in the present time or right now as the subject or the person is doing the act. The active mood of this is indicative, right? And the active mood of a verb describes the speaker's attitude towards what is being said. And this indicative is an, an indicative verb states facts, or in this case, it states truth. 
And then last of all, it's in a third person singular. Meaning that what Jesus is describing is personal to others. So but what does all of that mean, Brother Kenny? Well, it shows the importance of what Jesus is saying. To make a long, long explanation short, Jesus is saying that using defining words are personal to the user. And it happens as the words are coming out of the mouth. As the person is speaking, the words are defiling. Someone else cannot defile you with their words. It is your own personal words that will defile you with no exceptions. So be careful with your words, or better yet, be careful with what you store up in your heart because it will come out in your words defiling you and showing you for who you truly are. On a side note, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man or a person. Then that would imply that nothing that goes into a person will defile him or her. Meaning foods do not defile you. For Jesus himself said, do not call unclean what he has made clean. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by the foods that you eat. But back to our message. Your heart determines your speech. But not only does it determine your speech, it defines the meaning of your speech. Have you ever noticed someone retaliating? They will hastily spout off something in their defense or in protest. And then when it hits the person that it is aimed at a little too hard, they will quickly say, that is not what I meant. It may not be what you meant, but it sure is what you said. Their reply will usually be, you took it the wrong way. But what other way am I to take it? Then they will come back with, no, you're reading into my words. And then they will accuse you of being sensitive. You took my words out of context. What? Are you kidding me? Took your words out of context? Or here's the classic. They will go back years and dredge up past hurts and that have already been resolved they, they do this in order to justify themselves and to switch the blame to you or to someone else. This is a typical spirit of rejection. The truth is, words do hurt because words have meaning and words are alive. If we take the time to analyze it, words are actually weapons. And that is why words hurt so much. That childhood contradiction we used to chant, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a lie. It is a living lie made up to combat the sting of the words aimed at us. Words that actually do hurt us. And the more it hurts, the louder we chant. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Let me say it again. Words hurt because words are alive. Words carry the power of life and death in them. Think about the potency of words. God used words to create the whole universe. Everything we see, he used words to create. I cannot stress that enough. Here is a point you may want to consider. If you are easily offended or read into someone else, what someone else is saying or explaining, you may have a spirit of rejection. When you twist words and play the victim, blowing little things up into huge uncontrollable incidents, you probably have a spirit of rejection. When I say twist words, I mean that you are hearing what is not being said. 
Because what you're hearing and what is being said are two totally different and completely different things. The words you hear are accusative. The words you hear are personal attacks. Words aimed to mean when that is not true at all. They're merely someone else's own personal feelings and not accusatory at all. This is how I feel. This is how I feel about the situation. But the prince of the power of the air will quickly distort those airwaves and make the person hear something totally and completely different than what is actually being said. Or if you walk into a room and a group of people are laughing and, and, and talking, immediately you believe that they're laughing and talking about you. And you are hurt. To the core. That is a serious spirit of rejection. Listen to what Bruce Lee said, and I quote, you will continue to suffer if you have an emotional reaction to everything that is said to you. True power is sitting back and observing everything with logic. If words control you, that means everyone else can control you. Breathe and allow things to pass. Bruce Lee, end of quote. Please understand what the martial arts master was saying. If you let someone else's words affect you, you will suffer emotionally for it. But not only that, but now you have placed the controls of your emotions into the hands of anyone and everyone who had the words to do so, had the words to affect you. You've given them now that power to affect you. As I said, words are weapons and they can and do hurt. Words are weapons because with words we pray, with words we rebuke demonic spirits, and with words we praise the Lord. Praise is a weapon against such things as depression, anxiety, doubt, fear, and despair. When you're in despair, you begin to praise. With our words, we receive our forgiveness. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With our words, we draw close to God. Words are the most versatile armament known to man. With it, we can bless or curse. We can build up or tear down. We can create or destroy. We can heal or kill. We can encourage or discourage. Therefore, we must be very careful how we wield our weapons of words because we can wield that same weapon against ourselves. Psalms 106, verse 39. They defiled themselves by what they did. By their deeds, they prostituted themselves. Acts and deeds are synonymous with actions. Actions are thoughts performed, and our thoughts are words spoken to ourselves. We thought, therefore, we acted. We think or imagine evil. Then we turn those imaginations into actions. And when those actions are performed, they, lead, they tend to lead us in a separation from our God. And eventually, it leads us to death. Now, let us revisit our original question. Why would the Pharisees be offended at that parable? Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 12. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you not know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard the saying? Have you ever heard the maxim? Throw a stone in the pig pen, and the one that squeals is the one the stone hit. The only reason someone is offended is if they are the one the stone hit. You may say, oh, but Brother Kenny, maybe they're sympathetic to the cause. 
If you identify with the cause, you are a partaker in the cause. Thus, you suffer or celebrate as the cause suffers or celebrates. Which means you are one with the cause and the cause is with you. You are one with the cause and the cause is with you. You are one with the cause, but you get the point. There's no mistake, and I'm not downplaying it. Words hurt because words are weapons. And according to Jesus, words defile. Now the question is, how do you keep your words from defiling you? The quick answer is by cleaning up your heart. For out of its abundance, or in other words, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. But how do you clean up the heart? Well, we must go back to our first message, renewing our minds. We're not going to re-preach that message, but I will say this. In order to renew our minds, we must replace the old with the new. Here's what I mean. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18 through 20, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Therefore, we must replace these defiling thoughts that are abundant in our heart. We must reduce them to a skeleton crew and then eradicate them completely with extreme prejudice. Here is how to combat those things. Let us look to Paul because Paul gave us a catalog of combative instructions. He said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That is how we do it, my friends. We change the way we think. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let us start with evil thoughts. Here is what Paul wrote to combat evil thoughts. Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The way to turn evil thoughts into righteous thoughts, think about commendable things. Think about things of excellence or anything that is worthy of praise to our God and to our Father. These kinds of thoughts will convert evil or chase it away. So we think about such things instead of evil thoughts, like how to get even. The next one on Paul's list is whatever is lovely. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church that three things abide, faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. Love covers a multitude of sins, which would include the next sin on Jesus' list, murder. Also, Paul said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. If we do this, we will never even think about hating or disliking someone else. 
We would never say words to hurt them. We would never have a right word or have any type of falling out with anyone. Think of others as more important than yourself. We'll combat the urge to murder someone physically or spiritually or emotionally or with our words. A hard teaching, I know, but a necessary teaching. Adultery and sexual immorality can be combated with words that are pure and commendable. Think about verses such as, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Paul also wrote to the Romans, I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The three remaining are theft, false witness, and slander. For the combated verse, we will look at Leviticus chapter 19. Now the first verse that we will read covers all three, but I want to read all three verses. Look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. It says, you shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. But this is only one. There are other verses, numerous verses that can combat those things. These are just a base example to get you started. As for you, you go and find and clean your weapons, your weapons of words against those evils that proceed from the heart of man. Use those verses to overcome and renew your thought life. So in closing, I want to ask you, have you been putting these messages into practice? Have you been taking these messages to heart? Have you implemented the suggestions and teachings mentioned in this series? Next week, we will wrap up the series with part five, Words That Defeat. Please join us for that. And as usual, I cannot end this broadcast without asking you, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't, you can. It's easy. He has made it really, really easy for us. Understand this. Jesus is waiting for you with his arms open wide. Will you come to him today? Will you accept him today? He died for you. Well, if you want to accept Jesus as your own personal savior, all you gotta do is to repeat this prayer after me. Confess it with your mouth or confess it with your words and believe it with your heart and you will be saved. Repeat. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me, Lord God, for using my words as weapons against my fellow people, against my friends, against my family. I repent. Help me to watch my words. Help me to change the way that I think. Help me to get the evil thoughts out of my heart and pure, holy, righteous thoughts in that out of my mouth may flow blessings, may, may flow unity, may flow encouragement, may flow praises and blessings to our God. And Lord Jesus, I accept your free gift of life. For it's in your name that I pray. Amen.
If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, what I want you to do is to get a Bible, get a physical Bible, get it off your bookshelf or go out and buy one and get a highlighter. Highlight those verses that are meaningful, those verses that you can use to combat evil thoughts. Memorize those verses, hide them away in your heart that you might not sin against your God. Find yourself a Bible-believing church, not one of those wayward progressive churches. Turn away from those such churches. They're a damnation to the soul. Join a church that believes in holiness, that believes in righteousness, that believes exactly what the Bible says, what the Word of God proclaims. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord there we will be with him forever and ever. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.